from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, the next speaker is Vésteinn Ólason, a professor of Icelandic literature at the University of Iceland. And uh, Vésteinn is also the director of the Árni Magnússons Institute in Reykjavík. He will speak to us about Sögulegur atburður, an event worthy of a tale. The first word of my title, Sögulegur, actually the same word as saga-like, I suppose, uh, means worth narrating. Uh, criteria for what is worth uh, telling are inherent in all oral cultures, and a literary culture, in a literary culture they are an essential part of each narrative, each narrative genre. And of course, uh, originality or innovation is often uh, 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 rely, uh, people rely on, uh, on moving these, uh, changing these criteria. Uh, basically, the saga seems to be interested only in events that concern conflicts where honor and life are at stake. Describing daily life is not one of the saga's concerns. Nevertheless, we find scenes from daily life in the sagas and the study of such scenes can throw interesting light on the nature of the sagas of Icelanders, the Islandinga Sögur, and what characterizes them as a narrative genre. It is well known that many types of traditional narrative are indeed closed texts, that is, they move through conventional steps that lead to a predictable end, and the world is composed of a finite set of elements that can be arranged in different ways, but on the basis of fixed or nearly fixed rules, uh, grammar of sorts. These rules govern the understanding as well as the creation of a tale. The tale refers directly only to its own kind. The best known example of this finiteness is the fairy tale or märchen analyzed by Vladimir Propp. Heroic tale is a much looser and more varied concept than the fairy tale. Nevertheless, there have been many attempts to describe a basic form of tales about heroes with similar methods as Propp and his structuralist followers used. It is a basic uh, feature of both the fairy tale and the heroic tale or heroic song that every element in the text serves the action. This is not always obvious when descriptive or introductory elements are concerned, but in, but in fact, they serve either to characterize a type of person filling a certain role which is necessary for the action, or perhaps a type of environment, a conventional setting for such action as will occur. There is, of course, some room for variation in all these elements depending upon the convention. The world and action of written narrative can be just as conventional or closed as that of an oral narrative, but the written form usually allows for somewhat more variation. The Islandinga Sögur have many conventional elements. They have types of heroes and typical patterns of action. But quite often, there are passages in the texts which it is not easy to classify as belonging to a fixed or finite set of saga elements. We find, for instance, scenes from daily life that seem to open a window to an infinite and unpredictable world which surrounds the closed universe of the conventional saga. If such openings are found only exceptionally, the basic structure may remain intact, but if they become more numerous, if one window is replaced by many, we see a qualitative change from one genre to another. I believe such a change is going on in the Islandinga server. As an illustration, I intend to discuss five saga scenes from daily life. Two describe meals, one describes hair washing, and two show a man and a woman in the privacy of the bed chamber. There is hardly a more common act in people's life than having a meal. How it is done varies depending on time and place and the relationship of the individuals involved. 
as we all know. In many modern novels, we find detailed descriptions of such scenes. They are a convenient frame for dialogue and help to characterize the cultural environment of a place or a period and add local color. Moreover, many, for many modern people, writing and reading about meals is a source of pleasure in itself. Such scenes, uh, scenes with uh, describing meals are rare in the Islandinga Sögur, and those we find are certainly not included for the purpose of describing the enjoyment of a good meal. A gathering for eating and drinking, a banquet in a hall, is a conventional theme in Germanic heroic poetry, as we know from Beowulf, the Attic lays about Atli, and from sagas. It is a very formal occasion with emphasis on how people are seated according to status, and often a dialogue occurs which is crucial for the action to come. This theme is prominent in Icelandic sagas, such as Egil saga, Laxdæla saga, and Njál saga. In a couple of sagas, however, we read about a different kind of meal, informal and much closer to daily life than a banquet. In Fóstbræra saga, the saga of the Sorn brothers, one of the two heroes, Þorgeir Hávarsson, has sought quarters with a farmer on his travels around a sparsely populated area of Iceland. The farmer already has a visitor, a tramp called Bötraldi, whom the saga describes as a loner of no fixed abode, he was a large, powerfully built man with an ugly face, quick-tempered and vengeful, and he was a great slayer of men. End of quote. Although Thorgeir is described with more respectful terms, this description actually characterizes him quite well also. The farmer is a truly comic figure, faint-hearted and niggardly, although he is well off. The laws of hospitality force him to give the travelers shelter for the night and serve them food, but his lack of spirit and generosity is shown by the meal he serves. And now there's quite a long quotation, and I have a handout here, uh, I would like to read this out in Icelandic. Are there any non-Icelandic speakers who do not have the hand? <laughs> Implying that he did not uh, do, uh, follow this custom at all. Then picked up the mutton ribs, carved off the meat, and continued to eat until the bones were picked clean. Thorgeir took the cheese and cut off as much as he wanted, though it was hard and difficult to pair. Neither of them would share either the knife or the food with the other. Though the meal was not good, they did not bring out their own provision for fear that it would be seen as a sign of weakness. Or, I would prefer, they did not rise to serve themselves some food, for they felt that such a behavior would bring shame on their manhood. Uh, this scene is repeated next morning, only with the roles reversed. Thorgeir now grabs the meat, while Bötraldi tackles, tackles the old cheese. Then they leave the farm, change insults, and Thorgeir kills Bötraldi. <laughs> In a way that may be either the model for the famous description of how Skarpiaðin kills Thráin on the ice in Njál saga, or a parody of it, depending on which saga is earlier and how we interpret Fóstbræra saga. It is difficult to appreciate the humor and ambiguity of this episode when it is read out of context. It reaches its climax with one of Thorgeir's deeds, and Bötraldi is described as a formidable opponent. His killing adds one more trophy to Thorgeir's collection. However, the contest clearly shows that both heroes are nothing but brutal thugs. Their wanderings about the barren regions of northwest Iceland, their meager meal, and their fights can easily be seen as a parody of, or at least a contrast to, the wanderings of errant knights through the greenwood and their encounters with noble knights, their feast, feasts in castles and their single combats. The description of the meal we just read is a scene in a comedy, if not a parody. The conclusion is that Fostbræra saga is certainly not a closed, conventional, heroic tale, but an ambiguous and comic narrative which keeps a critical distance to the heroic convention. There are, of course, other episodes that support such an interpretation, so does the rather ornate style. In Heiðarvíga saga, the saga of the slayings on the heath, 
There is a scene describing how food is served. No less than the scene from Hosperata Saga, it gives us an unexpected glimpse into the daily life of Icelanders in the Middle Ages. And now comes another quotation. Uh, Bardi and his companions then went home to spend the night at his farm. The following morning, Kotlgris prepared them a meal. According to the custom at the time, uh, food was placed on the wooden platters before the men, as there were no dishes then. Something unusual happened. Three servings, intended for three men, had disappeared. He went, Kotlgris, went and reported this to Bardi, who said, lay the platters and say nothing of this to anyone else. Thurid said that her sons should not be served breakfast, but that she intended to serve them. Kotlgris brought forth platters, a platter for each man upon which food was served. Thurid then went in along the hall and placed a portion before each of her sons, which turned out to be the shelter of the ox split into three pieces. This passage introduces a goading scene, a hurt as it is called. The mother is here creating a situation where she can mock her sons to strengthen their thirst for revenge. The description serves the heroic plot of the saga by framing the dialogue between mother and son, and it makes the narrative more effective by first creating a puzzle, which then is solved by Thurider's speech. This is indeed a part of a conventional heroic pattern. The scene functions exactly as Guðrún Gjúkadóttir's hvöt in the Etic Lays Handis Málan Guðrúnar hvöt. The mother is sharpening the will of her sons and making them angry. It is a stock scene of heroic narrative, charging it with emotions and slowing down the action before the climbers. However, the circumstantial manner in which the preparation for the meal is described gives us a glimpse into the daily life of these people. The Sakaman also uses the opportunity to mark the distance in time by telling us how things were done differently at the time when the Saka took place. The Saka has a wider scope than the Etic play, Etic lay, and it needs detail which there is no room for in the lay. The details of this scene are not likely to have been recorded from oral tradition. The author of the Saka, who based his narrative on heroic models, which he knew from tradition, probably invented the scene with its descriptive detail as well as the dialogue. The broad approach of this form has called for innovation, which changes the form and opens it up. Compared with Gudrun's direct approach in the ethic lay, we cannot avoid to feel that Thurider's circum circumstantial way of introducing her goading words is slightly comic. And this feeling is strengthened when, a little later, she tries to accompany her sons on their ride for events, and they get rid of her by making her fall into a small stream, out of which she crawls and turns back home, bereft of the dignity that is befitting the mother of heroes. While Fosbrera Saga pays only lip service to heroic ideals and portrays the heroes as comic figures, Heidar Vega Saga is more strongly tied to heroic convention. However, the author now and again creates distance between the saga and the traditional heroic tale and appears to be very well aware of the short-sightedness of heroic conduct, even if he cannot help admiring it. Two more scenes from daily life illustrate this ambiguity. The first one gives a fine image of heroic splendor. The other shows that the hero although calm on the surface, is emotionally unfit for the intimate human intercourse of daily life. In the next chapter of Heidarvega Saga, before the one already quoted, when the brothers are gathering their forces, we find a scene that does not seem to be advancing the action and could for that sake be cut with no loss for the heroic plot. Bardi then rode off, and when he came to the farm at Bakki, where Thordis lived, a horse was saddled and waiting with a shield nearby. He and his followers rode with a thunder of hoofs into the hayfield across a hard plain. Outside were a man and a woman, who proved to be Thordis and Ott. She was washing his hair and had not completed the job as his head was still full of froth. 
as soon as she saw Barði, he, he saw Barði, he sprang to his feet and greeted him with a laugh. Barði returned his greeting and asked the woman to finish her work and wash him properly. The man allowed her to do so, then made himself ready and set off with Barði. There is no obvious reason for this picture of a widow washing her stewards hair. It is not sögulegt, and it does not seem to have any narrative function. Nevertheless, it enlivens the scene and makes it memorable. We can see that the men riding with Bardi, these Viking Age heroes, are not dirty gangsters, like the thugs of Hostbrera saga, and like the Vikings of some films we see. When Otter is introduced into the saga, he is thus described. Ott was a man of some consequence. Though he was neither wealthy nor of good family, he was well known. Otter has a strange surname. He is called Gebnar Otter, which connects him with the goddess Freya and therefore characterizes him as a ladies' man, although he is not a nobleman. It is likely that this nickname was known from the traditions about the slaying of the heath, on the heath and inspired the author to create this picture from daily life. It illustrates intimacy between the man and the woman and makes him come alive as a gallant figure. Although Otter is not a poet, as far as we know, the type is the same as that of the protagonists of the sagas of skalds. We may ask if the adventurous and gallant ladies' man was a traditional type or formed under the influence of romance. I shall not try to answer that question. But again, this scene shows us how the author of Heidar Vigasara uses a picture from daily life to transgress the limits of traditional narrative. Here, this is done in a more elegant and original manner than in the previous example. But I can sense no irony here. My last example from Heidar Vigasara is from its final chapter. The protagonist Bardi has married a woman of one of the best Icelandic families, Auður, daughter of Snorri the priest. Having lived together for more than a year, they leave for Norway, and there the following totally unprepared scene takes place. It happened one morning that they were both out in a nearby building. Bardi wished to sleep, but his wife intended to wake him. She took a small cushion and threw it in his face, as if it were a joke. He tossed it aside and this was repeated several times. Then he threw it at her and let his hand follow. That is, he hit her. She grew angry, picked up a stone and threw it at him. That same day, after men had gathered for drinking, Bardi stood up and named witnesses and said he was divorcing Auð on the grounds that he would not stand for her, from her tyranny nor anyone else. Nothing anyone said could dissuade him. His mind was so set on this. The fight between the couples is so real that it could have happened yesterday or 2,000 years ago. An innocent and even flirtatious pillow fight gets out of control and ends in disaster. At this point in the story, the heroic plot is finished and we are reading the aftermath. Since the hero has still not been killed, the author, according to saga conventions, has to dispose of him in some way. <laughs> in the rest of the chapter, we are briefly informed of the subsequent lives of the couple. Bardi journeys to Constantinople, joins the Varangian Guard, earns a good reputation and falls in battle. While, and I quote, Auð was married to another powerful man called Sigurd, son of Thori the Dog, the Bjarke clan, the finest of men is descended from them. Bardi is here portrayed as a lonely man, unable to form strong emotional ties, and the path he was forced to choose, the path of the avenger, proves to be a dead end. The feeling created is exactly, I think, the same as when we see the lonely hero of a Western movie ride towards the sunset after he has killed those who had to be killed and lost his friends and allies in the action. The saga man has here taken leave of the hero and given him the heroic death that is due to him, falling in battle in Constantinople. But he also honors another convention to mention the descendants of the main characters. The great people descending from Auður form a striking contrast to her husband Bardi, who leaves no offspring, ending his life in solitude. 
We could see this, of course, as an ironic or distanciating uh, attitude towards the heroic ideal itself. It is not often that the Islendinga sower give us a glimpse into the bed chamber of a couple, uh, as in the example above. Gisla saga Sursonar is an exception. In addition to scenes where important characters are killed in their beds in the presence of a wife or a sister, there is a more mundane, apparently trivial scene from a bed chamber. Thorkel Sursson, the brother of the protagonist Gisli, has overheard a chat between Gisli's wife Auður and his own wife Ásgerður where Auður suggests that Ásgerður has more love for Auður's brother, Viestin, than for her own husband. Ásgerður agrees, and their words indicate that the affair, affair has been serious. The women realize that Thorkel has heard their words when he rises from his resting place and recites a stanza saying that their words will lead to the deaths of one or more people. The same evening, the following scene takes place. Seem to have lost the English translation. Would you like me to read one passage in Icelandic? <laughs> yeah, I haven't got the handout itself. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyone who can. Yeah, okay. Uh, once he was there, uh, sorry, Thorkel ate very little that evening, as was the first and was the first to retire to the bed. Once he was there, Asgerd came to him, lifted the blanket, and was about to lie down when Thorkel said, I will not have you lying here tonight, nor for a very long time to come. Asgerd replied, Why this certain change? What is the reason for this? We both know what is behind this, said Thorkel, though I have been kept in the dark about it for a long time. It will not help your reputation if I speak more plainly. You think what you will, answered Asgerd, but I am not going to argue with you about whether I may sleep in this bed or not. You have a choice. Either you take me in and act as if nothing has happened, or I will call witnesses this minute, divorce you, and have my father reclaim my bride price and my dowry. Then you wouldn't have to worry about my taking up room in your bed ever again. Thorkel was quiet for a while. Then he said, I advise you to do as you wish. I shall not stop you from sleeping here tonight. <laughs> she soon made clear that what she wanted to do, and they had not been lying together for too long before they made up as if nothing had happened. The types of characters we meet here are well known from heroic narrative. Thorkell is a, the anti-hero, an indeterminate and cowardly man who does not do his duty uh, by honoring his obligations to his kinsmen and who generally does not keep his word. Ásgerður is a female hero, proud and determined and passionate. Obviously, she does not have the fierce pride of a Brynhildur who wants to have no one but the best of men. But she is not prepared to take any kind of humiliation from her husband, and she has no scruples about using her sexual power over him to silence him. There are fine psychological nuances here. Thorkell's lack, lack of character is never directly mentioned, let alone condemned, but is revealed through the contrast between his brave words and his action. As a matter of fact, both spouses act according to practical, unheroic considerations, but it is the woman who shows strength and determination. In spite of the conventional traits of this scene, it opens the heroic form towards daily life and refers to different kinds of text. I believe all the scenes I have dis discussed here do this in one way or another. They do not belong to the high points in the narrative, and they would be left out in most plot summaries, because they tell of events that in themselves are not worthy of a tale. Nevertheless, they belong to the web of the tale, bring it closer to the reader, and help her or him to see through the text. From the finite traditional heroic tale, they create one of the saga's many links to the infinite textual world of the past. The Islandinga sower have come to us as literature, and I believe that one of the things that make them fascinating 
is that we can see how they were formed by conflicting and even contradictory textual forces. The strongest influence behind them is the heroic tale, I believe. To simplify things, I believe that an oral genre that was developing from local historical traditions to a new form of heroic epic in prose was intercepted by literary tradition and turned into a new kind of narrative literature through the inclusion of the tales from daily life, among other things, and through an ambiguous attitude to heroic morality, identification and admiration conflicting with distanciation, the sagas develop traits that make them appealing to modern tastes and can sometimes be seen as foreshadowing the birth of the novel. Thank you. These fragments uh, suggest ever so obliquely how the medieval Icelanders thought about the sagas mm -hmm. uh, and how they construed the meaning of the sagas uh, at the dawn of the saga writing era. The fragments I have in mind uh, come from a chronicle of uh, Norwegian kings known as Morkinskina, uh, and, uh, which means rotten uh, parchment, an alluring title. Uh, and composed sometime around 1220, that is, at a date prior to the great emergence of saga composition in the 13th century. You'll find a small sample of the fragments on your handout, and I will refer you to that handout presently. I am told that the handouts are on the back table if um, anybody needs one. These samples uh, pertain uh, to two mid-11th century kings, Harald Sigurdsson Hardradi of Norway and Svein Ulfsson or Sven Estlesen of Denmark, kings who for a time were persistently at war with one another. We may begin with King Harald, whom I will call Harald Hard Rule as the English convention prescribes. King Harald seems to have been reputed among the Icelanders as the most resourceful and deeply perceptive of all the Norwegian kings. A passage in Morkinskina is quite explicit about his reputation, and I will quote that passage. King Harald was a powerful man and a firm ruler in Norway. He had a profound intelligence and it is the opinion of well-informed men that no one in all the northern lands uh, was more penetrating than King Harold. He was the most resourceful of men so that he was never without a remedy. Many of his adventures, that's the end of the quote, uh, many of his adventures uh, which are told at greater length in Morkinskina than those of any other uh, Norwegian king apart from St. Olaf, served to illustrate uh, Harold's special intelligence. And this is the nature of the first anecdote that I want to submit to you. At one point uh, during his hostilities with Denmark, Harold is trapped in a fjord uh, by the Danish fleet and deprived of access to drinking water. He remedies the situation by landing on an island and devising a stratagem to find water. He locates a snake, dehydrates it by the fire, fastens a thread to its tail, and lets it lead him to a hidden spring that only the snake knows about. <laughs> the author comments as follows, quote, the device was preserved in memory because it seemed wise and ingenious, end of quote. Tradition seems therefore to have clung not only to deeds of valor, but to intellectual feats as well. The intellectual category could also include particularly chiseled verbal exchanges. This type of tradition is illustrated by a little epilogue to the Battle of the River Niz, 1062, during which King Harold captures his enemy, Jarl Finner Arnason, uh, but offers to spare Finner's life. This is how the dialogue runs. It is number one on your handout. Do you wish to be spared, asked the king, even though you hardly deserve it? 
not by a dog like you, said the Jarl. Are you saying that you want your kinsman Magnus to spare you, asked the king. The king's son Magnus was in command of a ship but was still very young. Then the Jarl asked, what sort of reprieve can that whelp manage? The king found it amusing to tease the Jarl and asked, will you accept a reprieve from your kinswoman, Thora, the queen, Harold's wife? Then the Jarl asked, is she here? Here she is, said the king. Then Finnan made a vicious comment that was later remembered because it uh, indicates that he was so angry that he could not control his words. No wonder you bit so well since you have the mayor looking on. <laughs> the Arl's parting shot relates to the spectator sport of horse fighting in Iceland, a contest in which two stallions were pitted against each other. Icelandic research has established that stallions do indeed fight more fiercely if a mare is present. All Icelandic farmers presumably know that, but scholars have to read it in the Icelandic <laughs> learned journals. <laughs> For our present purposes, the authorial comment is more important than the matter of equine behavior. What the author does in this passage is to advance a theory on why the incident was remembered and presumably retold in tradition. Because, he says, it suggests that Finna Arnason was so angry that he could not control his words. The episode thus becomes a parable on self-discipline. The author suggests that the incident was remembered and repeated for the sake of the moral of the story. Jarl Finner cannot contain himself, but King Harold remains calm. Now, modern readers may find that moralization of the anecdote somewhat implausible, but the author returns to it a second time, as we shall see. Before finalizing the moral of the story, however, the author adds a second anecdote, this time about the defeated King Sven, who barely escapes from the Battle of the River Niz and takes refuge uh, in disguise in a remote cottage in the Danish forest. The woman who presides there, unaware of the king's identity and conforming to the sharp-tongued Harridan tradition, questions him about the outcome of the battle. When she learns the truth about the Danish disaster, she voices her opinion in no uncertain terms as follows. Woe to us, Danes. We are miserably provided for since our king is both halt and cowardly. Uh, as a matter of uh, historical interest, I should point out that a modern medical examination of King Sven's bones uh, revealed that he may in fact have been lame. The author now goes on to comment on the woman's malicious sally in the following words, and this is number two on your handout. This tale is only for the fun of it and worth telling only because it distinguishes wisdom from witlessness. Moreover, when the exchange of words between King Harold and Finner uh, was told, referring now back to that first episode, number one on the handout, the man who had the power showed mercy, and there was honor in that action and no lack of authority. But the Jarl showed how fearless he was. He was unable to do otherwise than to speak what was on his mind, uh, and in that he demonstrated consistency. He spoke only well of King Sven since he had been in his service, but he spoke angrily to King Harold, whom he had opposed. But King Harold treated uh, what he had to say like so many childish words, and that has been the view of everyone ever since. This passage exhibits an interpretive stance almost unparalleled elsewhere in old Icelandic literature, but it raises a number of confusing issues. The conclusion of the paragraph makes it clear that the interview between King and Jarl was known from oral transmission since it is assumed that there was a continuity of opinion, that the Jarl's words had always been considered childish. Such pointed exchanges were therefore the stuff of tradition. 
They must have been considered saga-worthy and deserving of retention, uh, perhaps as demonstrations of mental or verbal agility. Furthermore, it appears that people not only remembered such incidents, but also voiced opinions uh, about how they should be understood. This author believes that Finner's rejoinders had always been considered so many childish words, and by implication that King Harold's tolerance was viewed as a model of moderation. This opinion may, however, be the perfect illustration of why authors should never be believed on matters of interpretation. The construction our author puts on this episode seems, in fact, to be quite eccentric. In the total context of old Icelandic letters, it is evident that stinging repartee is not reported in the sagas because it established a contrast between wise and foolish behavior, but because it was amusing and had entertainment value. In particular, it was a way for the underdog to even the score uh, when confronted with overpowering force, and that point is illustrated by a number of other sagas. The response of reader or, or listener would have been to laugh at the honed wit, in this case the insulting comparisons to animals and the escalation from dog to whelp to stallion to mare with the lurking insinuation that King Harold is getting his sexual gratification with a mayor. Thus, the interpretive situation in these passages is anything but transparent. It appears that the author's response may not be in line with reader response at large. The author wishes to moralize the tale in terms of unreasonable rage and good-humored tolerance. That reading may be consonant with the understanding of Jarl Finner's words in the first paragraph of the handout as a loss of control, but is surely not consonant with the moralizing earlier in the same paragraph to the effect that Finner was fearless and consistent in his service to the Danish king. Our overall experience of old Icelandic literature may well suggest that this latter assessment is closer to a cultural consensus and more in concert with public opinion. But it probably uh, is not going to uh, get us very far to run through all of the possible interpretive permutations. The value of the remarks in Mordekinskina lies not in a transparent uh, and consistent viewpoint, but in the evidence uh, it affords that readers, and presumably listeners as well, did in fact moralize. We may also safely assume that they moralized differently. They would have differed with each other, just as our author offers differing interpretations in one and the same paragraph. In a word, the moral of the story was open for debate. This interpretive indeterminacy uh, is no less characteristic of the anecdote about King Sven's refuge in a lowly cottage. Here, too, uh, we find a moralizing stance. We're told that the story serves to illustrate wisdom uh, and witlessness. But that summation is a little cryptic. It's clear that the woman's comment describing the king as both halt and cowardly exemplifies witlessness. But who exemplifies wisdom? Mordekinskine implies that the king, who is refer referred to as the man who had spoken previously, is, the king is present with one follower, and the follower does the talking in this uh, episode. Anyway, uh, we are led to understand that the king speaks uh, the following words in order to parry the uh, old woman's thrust. He says, I suspect, old woman, that the king is not cowardly, but neither is he very fortunate in battle. Snorri Sturluson's Heimskring makes it quite explicit that the, that the king, it is the king that speaks these uh, words, uh, but is it the king who demonstrates wisdom? Are his words wise because they are moderate? The problem is that he is constrained to be moderate if he wishes to maintain his disguise and protect his identity. Clearly, no moral credit accrues from a moderation that is imposed by the circumstances. In a sequel to the story told by Snorri, the king turns out to be anything but moderate. 
He summons the old couple who harbored him to his court, rewards the husband richly, but refuses his request to take his wife with him, offering instead to give him, quote, a much better and wiser wife. <laughs> the author of Morkinskin <clears throat> does not recount this sequel and may not have been aware of it, although Snorri states that the story came to Norway and became famous so that everybody should have known about it. We could, as an alternative, imagine that the author of Morkinskina uh, thinks that the husband, by dint of saying nothing at all, uh, is the one who exemplifies moderation. But since the husband is not mentioned in the Morkinskina version, we cannot be certain that the author imagined that he was present at all. This is not the only difficulty in the passage. Uh, the moralizing begins with a remark uh, that the tale is only a Gamans frasogn, a tale for the fun of it, and not at all worth telling except that it makes a moral point. Again, other listeners and readers may have disagreed with this narrow reading and might have emphasized the entertainment value of a story in which a king is demeaned to his face, but under the circumstances is unable to respond. Such readers could have pointed out that the moralizing option is unclear and perhaps beside the point. What the passage therefore illustrates, once again, is not a clear-cut interpretation, but possible avenues for discussion. The author of Morkinskina could have explored these avenues with any number of readers, including Snorri Sturluson, who made extensive use of his book. Such discussions would no doubt have produced plenty of disagreement. Some years ago, Carol Clover theorized about the audience of the sagas, more properly about two uh, audiences, a general audience of listeners and a highly skilled audience composed of other saga authors. She wrote as follows. To concede the literary artistry of the saga is to concede a self-conscious artist one who presumably studied the work of others with an eye to imitation or improvement. Just as, according to Egil Saga, Einar Skalaglam and Egil Skalagrimson met at the All Thing and conversed at length and pleasurably on the subject of poetry, quote, a topic they both found enjoyable, so must Saga authors have known one another and formed their own literary society. At some level, each individual saga is a response to the sagas preceding it and a standard for the ones to come." End of quote. We may perhaps pursue Clover's observation one step further. If there was an audience interested in and able to discuss literary technique, so too there must have been an audience ready to discuss the significance of a story. That much emerges, I think, from the authorial comments in Morkinskina. But we've also seen that not even the comments of one author in a single passage are necessarily reconcilable with one another. How much more divergent uh, would have been the views of several authors in conversation with one another or even several non-specialist listeners? Morkinskina affords us a quite novel insight into the interpretive perspectives that were to be found in medieval Iceland. These perspectives attach to a couple of individual episodes and by no means embrace the whole saga. We may bear in mind, however, that an important genre of early Icelandic prose fiction was also episodic, and I refer here to the so-called Thetir, the little stories, often about adventurous Icelanders in their encounters with foreign kings. These stories seem to lend themselves particularly well to generalizing interpretation. If episodes in Morkinskina and the episodic Thetir were subject to interpretation, we can hardly doubt that interpretation was readily practiced. In addition, it would perhaps be artificial to argue that episodes were interpreted, but whole sagas were not interpreted. Nor is it likely that interpretation was restricted to an elite composed of saga authors. Now, when the author of Morkinskina states that such and such has been the view of everyone ever since, 
He is in all likelihood not referring to a literary clique, but is suggesting that common listeners and common readers had an opinion as well. In the 20th century, uh, we took to writing books about the Icelandic sagas, sometimes large interpretive books. We may well have done so with a certain shamefacedness uh, because the sagas do not offer much interpretive guidance. And we may feel that our efforts bring extraneous categories to bear. We are perhaps haunted by the suspicion that our approaches have no foothold in medieval Icelandic thinking that Icelanders in the 13th century would have found our surmises strange and irrelevant. For example, our peculiarly inconclusive readings of Kravnkl's saga. But perhaps the authorial reflections uh, cited from Morkinskina will be sufficient to convince us that 13th century Icelanders would have recognized the interpretive impulse. They too could ponder the moral of a story. They may, in fact, have found our speculations no stranger than those that they heard from their countrymen and contemporaries. They would have disagreed with us, of course, but perhaps no more than they would have disagreed with their fellow readers in their own day. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.